Uh, anyway, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to the Katz Institute and many thanks to Jackie yes, for arranging all things for me. Uh, in this talk, I would like to take up three different um, subjects. They are related, certainly, but they are different, and I would like to, uh, to treat them separately. First, the post-electoral context after the 2nd of July. Then, the end of Fox's administration. How is he leaving power? And the beginning of Calderon's term. What, is he, his, wh what will be the assets and the, li and the liabilities that Fox will leave uh, to Calderon? It's the second time that the PAN will be in power. Uh, as you know, only by 0.5% of difference between the two forerunners. But nonetheless, it is Pan who will stay in power for another six years in terms of the, of the presidency. Um, as you are well aware, the aftermath of the 2nd of July has been everything in Mexico but swift. Uh, Mexicans had to wait for over two months to be sure who their president was going to be for the next six years. It was not, in fact, a level-headed uh, wait but one full of uncertainties in which one party constantly challenged the possibility of not being declared the lawful winner. And it was not a matter of a, of a discourse, it was a matter of an anti-institutional discourse and uh, a discourse that was beset of, of, by intimidation, by mobilizations around the capital city, by the siege of main avenues and squares and the promise of disrespect regarding the ruling of the electoral institutions, of the electoral court in Mexico. The strategy of communication of Andres Manuel López Obrador and his mobilization uh, was successful, very successful, first of all in terms of spreading doubts about the legitimacy of the whole electoral process and also about the impartiality of judicial authorities. Uh, on the night of the 2nd of July, everybody was very happy in Mexico because in spite of having had a very harsh political competition, uh, I mean, all the broadcasters said, well, we had a very clean elections, we had peaceful elections, uh, nothing unusual to report. And then, a few hours later, uh, doubts began to spread. Secondly, it was a success, his mobilization, López Obrador's mobilization, for it did not meet with uh, repression on part of the federal authorities in spite of the heavy disturbances it caused in terms of uh, traffic, public transport, commerce, tourism, economic activity in general. The ruling came two months later and as expected and as announced, the loser party did not abide by the decision. Mobilizations persisted, the call uh, of Calderon to establish dialogue, political dialogue with the PRD and with its candidate was disregarded and expectations as to further civil resistance actions remained in the air. Nonetheless, and although López Obrador, or although López Obrador's discourse became ever more radical, things started to go gradually back to normal. Sooner than expected, the siege of the main square was lifted and López Obrador started to lose ground in terms of credibility, in terms of agenda setting, and in terms of uh, media coverage. By September, opinion polls showed that if elections were to be conducted again, Calderón would have won not only by 0.5%, but by a 10 to 14% difference. Um, there's a... That was the post, uh, that's a poll from uh, Consulta Mitowski uh, two months after the elections and that, that is what it shows, 47% for Felipe Calderón and 33% for AMLO. And the question was if only the two forerunners were running again for the presidency. And in the same directions, polls show, showed that the PRD was again regarding as a bullying party unwilling to cooperate and associated with violent methods. So the PRD started losing ground in terms of its stand in society. Where and why did López Obrador movement began to frail and lose part of its popular appeal? Um, I think several factors must be taken into account apart from obviously time. His experience when federal authorities attempted to impeach him uh, two and a half years ago made him uh, 
overconfidence, I believe. There was, however, a big difference. In this last case, in the case of the impeachment, most people in Mexico, not only in Mexico City, but most people in the nation, thought that he was being treated in an unfair way, that he had a just cause to fight for, and that he would win over that cause. In the case of elections, people were divided regarding whether elections were rigged or not rigged, and did not agree with the actions or most of the actions that uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador was proposing. A second factor is that uh, López Obrador communication strategy is that of uh, his communication strategy regarding electoral fraud. The night of the elections, uh, he claimed, Andres Manuel López Obrador appeared on TV, claiming that he had won by 500 million votes, by 500,000 uh, votes. When uh, exit polls results started to flow, he dismissed them as deceptive, all of them. When preliminary results were publicized by the electoral authorities, he dismissed them again, saying that authorities were not trustworthy. As days went by and poll after poll started confirming the, the results, uh, his arguments moved from uh, cybernetic fraud to what he called uh, lo, uh, an old-fashioned fraud, yes, a fraud made when they were counting the votes, a uh, fraud made in the polling stations, a uh, fraud made through the, through the ballot. Next, it was argued that PRD had lost in those polling stations where the PRD did not manage to place representatives. We had over 100,000 uh, polling stations, and he said that it was very uh, suspicious that precisely in those uh, polling stations where PRD representatives were uh, absent, he had lost. It was proved that that was not the case and that there was no correlation between representatives in polling stations and uh, Felipe Calderón or Andres Manuel López Obrador winning in that polling station. Later it was argued that fraud was pl planned and staged months before the elections through the selection of polling stations personnel. That is, that the IFE, that the Federal Institute, had staged this fraud. In the end, he claimed that the elections were unfair and were unequal, and that they had to be annulled and the whole process restaged. But one by one, arguments proved weak and unconvincing, and the impression that López Obrador was unwilling to accept defeat and determined to promote an institutional rupture was fixed among most people in, uh, in Mexico. A third reason for López Obrador's movement declined was the open hostility that he has repeatedly shown towards most social and political institutions and its representatives. He, com he confronted the Supreme Court and the electoral justices, electoral authorities, the president, all political parties except those who participated in his coalition, most media owners and workers, pollsters, intellectuals and opinion makers, entrepreneurs and even church ministers. According to his sayings, most of these people and most of these institutions worked consistently and systematically to block his arrival to power. And the reason for this behavior, he claimed, was the fear that López Obrador would put an end to the privileges all these people had in Mexico. But maybe, and this is the last uh, reason I want to refer to, the most damaging element for López Obrador's purpose was the blatant contradiction between playing with and playing against the democratic institutions in Mexico. It soon became very difficult for him to explain to his followers and to the population at large that presidential elections were rigged, but Congress elections were not rigged. How to explain an enormous but partial fraud? How to explain that the PAN's presidential candidate was illegitimate, but congressmen, especially those of the PRD, were not? How to justify the PRD's deputies and senators assuming their seats in Congress if electoral validation of the, their own election was coming from a corrupt institution like the IFE, the, the, federal, the Electoral Federal Institute, and if Congress itself was part of what he called the simulated republic in Mexico. 
and the same happened with local elections. It is true that an upsurge of his movement occurred w when, um, when Chiapas elections were won by the PRD against a coalition of PRI and PAN. Nonetheless, the fact that the PRD accepted to enter such elections stressed the contradiction in López Obrador's movement. On the one hand, disavowing established institutions, electoral or otherwise, and on the other, playing by the rules and complying with the results when these results favored the PRD or Andrés Manuel's uh, uh, candidates. And even more damaging for the perspectives of sustaining his movement was Tabasco's local election that was that took place uh, last 15th of October, and it was, as you know, López Obrador's homeland. The PRD lost, and no one was willing to buy the argument that once again elections were manipulated. His candidate lost by six points against the pre-candidate. In any case, the fact that the PRD legislatures, uh, legislators assumed their posts and have started to work since the 1st of September <clears throat> with their fellow legislators from the PRI and, uh, and PAN, and the fact that the PRD governors, except perhaps that of Mexico City, Mr. Ebrard, <clears throat> all of them have met Calderón and have declared that they will work with him. All of this is evidence of a certain political normality that cannot be ignored in Mexico, and maybe also of the unwillingness of part of the PRD, of part of this party, not to lose the enormous gains, the leap forward in the 2006 elections. After Tabasco's defeat, 15th of October, López Obrador has basically disappeared from the news and the public stage. We heard from him two days ago. Um, he was uh, heading one of these uh, demonstrations uh, asking uh, the governor of Oaxaca to leave his post, but we, had, we hadn't heard from him in the last two weeks. His next move, as it has been announced, will be tomorrow, on the 3rd of November, when he will disclose the structure of his new cabinet, his legitimate cabinet, the 20th of November, when he will be declared the legitimate president of Mexico in a theater in Mexico City, the 1st of December, where, when there will be an attempt to prevent Calderón assuming power, and the next important date is March 207, when the Democratic Convention will gather in order to draft a new constitution, or at least to propose one. All these arguments do not amount, certainly, to saying that López Obrador is out of politics or that we will uh, not be hearing from him anymore. On the contrary, uh, he lost in one of the most contested elections in Mexico, maybe the most contested, uh, contested election Mexico has seen in recent years, at least one-third of the population believes he was robbed from, uh, of his victory. His party holds five governorships, and his party is also the second force in Congress, in the lower house, the third force in the Senate house, and he still has a very, very strong grip over his uh, party, over the PRD. But it does amount to say, or it does amount to saying, however, that for all we know, the electoral process is over. Mexicans have an elected president, and this president will face a very complex situation. We'll have a very hard time beginning on the 1st uh, of uh, December. Um, let me now turn to the end of Fox's administration and the beginning of Calderón's. How will the one leave power and the other assume it? I believe that an upright and dependable assessment of Fox administration is still to be written. It's too soon. As of today, he remains a very popular chief of state and government, although most journalists, opinion makers, and intellectuals have a very poor opinion of him. Fox is among, uh, amongst the most highly ranked heads of state among Latin America and does not fare low if we compare him with presidents and prime ministers in Europe. He ranks, for example, above Germany, Great Britain, Spain, or France. And this is especially so if we consider that he is but a month away from leaving uh, his, uh, his post. Um, and there you go. Those are the Latin American presidents. In the first column, you see the, the month 
of, of the term of, of, of the presidential term. And as you can see, Mexico and the USA are closest in terms of uh, months in, in the administration, 69 and uh, 72. And uh, well, Mexico, Mexican president has 61% of approval. He comes next only after Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, and he ranks above places like Chile, where Bachelet, Michel Bachelet just assumed power last year, or um, Chile, or, uh, well, we will see Brazil. Uh, Lula has just been re-elected by uh, 60, over 60% 60 of the vote. However, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm um, conscious that popularity is not a transferable commodity, and especially that popularity does not, in presidential systems, and especially in presidential systems with no re-election, uh, being popular does not enhance your power. As with most uh, governments, Fox is one of lights and shadows. His administration certainly did not manage to fulfill some of his uh, most publicized political offers, namely 7% growth, the ordering of Chiapas conflict in no more, no less than 15 minutes, or the creation of uh, over 1 million jobs per year. Also, he was not successful in pushing through Congress two of his most important bills, that is fiscal and energy reform. He wasn't able to push forward uh, the electoral reform or the security and access to, just, to justice reform either. He failed, as you will know, in attaining a reasonable migration agreement with this country. Uh, and on the other side, he nonetheless delivered other goods, economic stability, much more transparency and accountability, full freedom of speech and press, public health regardless of job status. In Mexico, only those that have a formal job are allowed to go into the public health system. And he introduced Seguro Popular with four, four and a half million people now covered by this regardless of their job status, as I am saying. Uh, housing and a relative, albeit insufficient, uh, reduction of extreme poverty. In terms of the economic balance sheet, Fox will leave more liabilities certainly than assets. He will leave a stable economy, but one in need of growth. He will leave a working economy, but one in need of being far more competitive, a labor market that has to be re-regulated, an economy that lacks in competition and is jam-packed with monopolies and privileges, a bankrupt uh, pension system, Finally, although public finances are in order, Mexico is still living one of the worst tax collection systems. Taxes amount to only 11% of the GDP, probably the worst country regarding tax collection. Uh, on the social and political field, debts are no less severe. Public services have to be revamped. Corporatism was left almost untouched. Organized crime, crime Drug trafficking and public insecurity have not been controlled. Federalism has to be refurbished. But maybe more, trouble, more troubling is uh, the very scarce advances regarding the access to justice and the observance of the rule of law. Expectations when Fox entered government were very high regarding the rule of law. And maybe it was the biggest um, decep deception, the biggest yet. Yeah, in sum, pretty much the same old problems Mexicans have historically confronted. And uh, well, what about the objective conditions in which Calderón will become, a president, will become president on the 1st of December, and what I believe will be his room of maneuver? The circumstances in which Fox and Calderón became presidents are very similar in some ways, and this distinct in, in others, more similarities than differences. Um, in terms of both votes, both of them had less than, um, uh, than an absolute majority. Um, the, the, I'm sorry I didn't put Fox and Calderón, but this row, the, uh, the second row is uh, Fox, and then it's uh, Calderón. In terms of credibility, Fox came to power with a lot of credibility. And if I'm generous, um, Felipe Calderón will come with a medium rank uh, uh, credibility. In terms of expectations, which is not good, Fox came to power with very high expectations and uh, Calderón 
uh, is coming into power. I believe this is a liability for Fox, or this was a liability for Fox, and it will work to the advantage of Calderón. Uh, in who, uh, the expectations are low regarding his uh, coming administration. The, the behavior of the opposition was very responsible during the transition, uh, the transition period uh, of Fox, and it has been defiant during this transition period. And they both are going to face a divided government and, and a very unfavorable distribution of regional power. Uh, but let me look at each of these a little more closely. Although both arrived to power with less than the absolute majority, Fox received 43% of the votes, while Calderón received only 35%. Mm -hmm. And more important, while the difference between Fox and La Bastida, that was the pre-candidate uh, between the two forerunners in the 2000 election, was 7%, the difference in 2006 was only of 0.5%, 230,000 votes at most. I have argued and I believe firmly that in systems with no runoff rules, a president is as legitimate with or without an absolute majority of votes, and that a majority that does not translate into a majority in Congress leaves the president as powerless or as powerful as the, con as the Constitution makes him or her. It doesn't matter whether he comes with a 40% or a 45%. Nonetheless, the 35% vote in last election was connected to credibility, and Fox victory represented the first time in Mexican history in which power was transferred from one party to the other in a peaceful way, in an institutional way, that is, without resorting to revolutionary means. It's unbelievable, but it was the first time in 200 years of independent uh, existence of Mexico. Um, uh, and also with Fox, an overwhelming majority of Mexicans believed that they were, that elections were very well conducted and very well counted. Uh, in sharp contrast uh, with this situation, the 0.5% difference of Calderón, uh, together with intense campaign of the PRD, left over one third of the population, as I said before, with serious doubts regarding the fairness of the results, uh, the, f the fairness and the results of the 206 election or 206 electoral contest. It must also be mentioned that the very harsh campaigns, the president intervention in the process, the very close results and the electoral aftermath left a very polarized society in Mexico and this uh, wasn't a challenge for Fox. Finally, while in the 2000 election, the PRI readily accepted the result, and by midnight, every new Fox was going to be president. In this election, it was not until the last possible day, that is the 6th of, of September, two months later, that we knew for sure that Pan's candidate had won, and as of today, the second political force in Congress refuses to accept this uh, Calderon's victory. In terms of the distribution of power, both at the national and at the subnational levels, Things are not very different if we compare Fox and Calderón's experiences. Pan didn't, ma didn't make serious inroads in governorships during uh, Fox terms, uh, Fox's term. Uh, both entered with a very unfavorable situation regarding governorships and both facing a divided uh, government. Uh, although, again, there are uh, differences. Just, just to see how democracy has advanced in Mexico, I put here the distribution of power for the, for the President's party from 1982 up to 2006. If you see when de la Madrid, that's not too far away, it's only tw 20 years ago. Uh, uh, when de la Madrid came to power, he had, well, obviously the presidency, then he had 100% of the Senate House, 75% of the lower house, 100% of the governors, that means the 32 governors belong to the President's party, 76% uh, of the local deputies and 97% of the municipalities. Things started changing after 1988, mainly uh, through uh, six successive electoral reforms. And uh, well, uh, PRI started to lose its hegemonic grip over the system. And then we come to Fox and Calderón, well, Cedillo, in, I place here 1994, but the first divided government we had was in 1997 in the intermediate elections. I'll come back to this uh, later. But in terms of uh, 
both governorships and uh, local deputies and counties, <coughs> the PAN or, or Calderon's PAN will face more or less the same situation as, um, as uh, Fox did. Um, Regarding Congress, as I was saying, divide, uh, the divided government is a very recent phenomenon in Mexican politics. It appeared for the first time in 1997. We have had since four consecutive uh, episodes of, uh, of uh, divided government. Uh, that of Cedillo in 1997, both legislatures of President Fox and this newly elected uh, Congress. However, there are very important differences in terms of um, in terms of the type of divided government Mexican presidents have faced. Um, each experience has been different. In the first case, that of uh, Cedillo, uh, uh, pre-holding power, the president par uh, the president's party retained a clear majority, 60 percent in the Senate. It was the first minority, so to speak, 48 percent of. Uh, the lower house, and as argued before, maintained a distribution of local power that was as absolutely advantageous for him. Cedillo's um, party uh, retained 25 governors and 22 local legislatures. And I insist on the distribution of political power at the local level, because in order to modify the constitution in Mexico, you need not only two-thirds majority in Congress, but in both houses, but also the approval of half of the local uh, legislatures. That's why I stress so much the point of the advantageous uh, situation in terms of the distribution of local power. Mm. When Fox assumed government, his party came second in both cham chambers, uh, 41 in his first uh, legislature in the lower house, and 30 percent, it descended 10 points in his uh, second and 34 percent in the Senate. The uh, senators are elected for six years, so it's once every term. And uh, he had only seven governors and four local legislatures in the hands of PAN. This situation meant that for, for Cedillo, that the PRI maintained its veto, veto power over constitutional re reform and Fox did not. PAN did not have a veto power and, uh, and uh, Cedillo did. Furthermore, while Cedillo could reform the Constitution, making an alliance with any of the two major opposition parties, namely, pre or, um, namely PAN or PRD, Fox needed necessarily the PRI. Otherwise, he could not reform the Constitution. Calderón, however, is in a better position regarding Congress. The 206, uh, 206, uh, 2006 elections rendered the following distribution of the lower house. Um, that's the total seats. Of, uh, we have 500 seats in the in the lower chamber, uh, and he's in a better position not only because his party came first in both houses. It does not hold a majority in either of the houses, but it, it is the first minority in both houses. But also because the distribution of seats among the opposition parties is much more dispersed than before. For the first time in Mexico, the sum of, uh, of the small parties that we call is above 60 deputies in the Chamber of Deputies. Yeah. Um, so that so that allows um, Calderón many possibilities, both in terms of uh, constitutional reforms and in terms of uh, ordinary reforms. Um, you need in Mexico 251 uh, votes in the lower house or in the upper house in order to pass ordinary legislation, and you need 333 votes in Congress to pass um, constitutional reform. We have very disciplined parties in Mexico. Uh, maybe the PRD is the less disciplined, but still, I mean, if you if you uh, if you evaluate the discipline rate through the Rice uh, Index, I mean, PRD is very close to one. In particular, there is uh, no chance for the opposition parties in Congress to pass constitutional reform without the president's party. They have all together, the whole opposition together has 294 seats and they need 333 votes. So no way that they can pass 
a, a constitutional reform without the PAN. That is why all these win minimal winning coalitions, uh, all of them have the PAN uh, in, in them. This also means that Calderón's party has veto power in both chambers, not only in the Senate, as Edillo had. Uh, on the other hand, if we turn to ordinary law, those are the minimal willing coalitions also, uh, the large opposition parties, that is the PRI and the PRD, cannot pass ordinary law without the cooperation of either PAN or the aid of at least two small parties. So in most coalitions, either for ordinary law or for re constitutional reform, they need the PAN. And the fifth, the President's party has a wide variety of alternatives to strike congressional coalitions, especially to, fa uh, to pass ordinary, um, uh, ordinary law. However, it must be said that the President's party does need a cooperation of any of the two large opposition parties in order to pass constitutional reform. Uh, this is not only because of how the, uh, of the distribution of seats in Congress, but also because back in 1993 we passed a law saying that no party uh, can hold by itself more than two-thirds of uh, the seats in Congress. So no matter how well you fare in elections, you are not allowed to have more than 333 uh, seats by yourself. Uh, having dealt with these arithmetics of, of Congress, of Congress let's, let me go back to, to real politics. Calderón will assume power in less than a month and we have still more, many more questions than, than answers. The facts are a likely riot in Congress on the 1st of December. We had one back on the 1st of September when they did not allow President Fox to give his State of the Union address. Second, uh, the second force in Congress, PRD, unwilling to establish dialogue with the President, although we have good signs in terms that they've been dealing already with other political forces in Congress and they are st striking deals in and doing some of the agenda setting. Third, a third force in the lower house, the PRI, willing to take advantage of its blackmailing power towards the President party towards the PAN and is doing it very successfully. Uh, Calderón and his party are afraid of not being able to enter Congress on the 1st of December to be named president and uh, PRI is uh, taking advantage of this situation and is striking deals against, uh, against PRI's compliance with, P, with, with PAN in order for Calderón to take uh, to, to assume power. Uh, fourth, a country in need of constitutional reform to start solving some of its most pressing problems, scarce public resources, non-competitive prices, pensions, and the rest, they all need uh, constitutional reforms. And fifth, a country definitely full of privileges in which everything rules but the rule of law for, every, for everyone. How will Calderón's government deal with this issue? We st we, with all these issues, we still don't know. One of the few things, he has been quite a passive, so to speak, uh, uh, president-elect. Uh, he, uh, he has not publicized many of the programs he, we suppose he's trying to draft, but one of the few things that he has told us are, I would say, that he has three priorities, public security, employment and poverty. Poverty he has introduced uh, as a way of taking up part of Andrés Manuel's uh, López Obrador's agenda. Second, he's determined to hold under control macroeconomic variables like deficit, inflation, interest rates. Uh, that's the way we should be um, explaining Mr. Agustín Carsten's appointment as as his coordinator of economy in the transition team. Third, that he will put his relation with Congress at the center of his priorities. And fourth, that he will wait until next year to propose the structural reforms which he deems necessary. Those, I would say, are the only four things that Calderón has told us, really told, I mean, apart from political discourses every, every day, no? Mm. 
apart uh, from persuasion and willingness to fully use his constitutional powers, which are not as great as many people think, are less than most Latin American heads of state uh, have. Uh, he has the veto power, regulatory powers, and he has certainly the use of force. Uh, he has not many mechanisms to fulfill his campaign pro uh, promises. There are, however, um, different ways of dealing with five issue areas which I want to mention and which I believe will be, be crucial at the beginning of his term and in which Calderón will have to improve as compared to Fox administration. I believe there are five issue areas in which Fox definitely failed and uh, marked his whole uh, term. Five issue areas that will create reputation and that will be indicative of the type of presidency uh, Calderón wants uh, to lead. Uh, let me review them briefly. It will take me another five to ten minutes and that will be it. Um, first, cabinet formation and organization. In the coming days, Calderón will have to decide what kind of cabinet, cabinet he will have. The two most uh, obvious options are either a party cabinet or a coalition cabinet. I don't want to speak about a coalition government, but I mean, I will downgrade it. We have no clue as to how he proposes to confront this crucial decision. We know how Fox confronted, confronted it. A party cabinet has the advantage of bringing cohesion, discipline and loyalty to the cabinet, three things that Fox didn't enjoy. A coalition cabinet should at least, in theory, bring support either from Congress or from social sectors whose support is needed for certain programs. That's the rationale uh, behind uh, a coalition cabinet. Fox did not decidedly go for either of these two options. It is true, as Castaneda has claimed, that it was not, as many people say, a headhunter's uh, cabinet. Yeah, I mean, if we go through the names that started with Fox, we will see that this is not uh, the case. It, it was not a case also, as you say, in, in, in United States of best and the brightest, no. Although there is much of a myth in this idea that he opted for a cabinet out of headhunters, it is true that he did not use his appointment powers to enhance, enhance his political leeway. On the other side, cabinet management during Fox was far from what once would have, uh, uh, far from what one would have expected. The redesign of presidential offices proved very inefficient. Uh, it produced jealousy among incumbents, duplicity of functions, lack of discipline, lack of responsibility, and it also brought a lot of uncertainty as to who the legitimate and authorized political actors were. The opposition didn't know who to talk to if they wanted to get through uh, some proposal. Entrepreneurs didn't know who to deal with. Um, head of, uh, of trade unions didn't know uh, whether they should speak with the presidential office, with the secretary of government, with the secretary of, uh, of labor. The second issue, uh, well, uh, as I was saying, Felipe Calderón has given us no clue except for Carstens. Yeah, who is a member, as you know, he, he was second in the International Monetary Fund. Uh, he's back in Mexico. He used to be under secretary uh, during most of Fox's administration. And he has promised not only to keep economic variables under control, but to uh, also to promote uh, public and private investment and to create employments. But apart from him, we re and maybe Juan Camilo Mourinho, who will be heading the, the office at Los Pinos, we have no clue as to who will go to Pemex, to the energy sector. Most of what you have been reading is nothing but uh, chismes, how is it, gossip. Uh, the sec second issue area in that I believe Fox failed is that of political communication. It is clear that Fox was an overexposed and less than careful president, both in structured discourse, press conferences, or improvised public appearances. 
Furthermore, instead of using his secretaries of state to fight over controversial issues, he was always on the front line. But maybe even more damaging for Fox were, on the one hand, the lack of consistency in which he often incurred. Witness, for example, his two discourses here in the USA in 2002 regarding the pre. In the morning, he said that he was willing to make a coalition with the PRI and that without the PRI, Mexico was not going to advance and that you needed uh, the PRI in Congress, otherwise the reforms could no, not go through. In the afternoon, he gave a discourse that in which he denostated the PRI, in which he said that most of Mexican um, failures were due to the PRI. Yes, and, and those two discourses were pronounced on the same day regarding uh, the same issue. And also there was a blatant contradiction among his closest co collaborators. Four different pronouncements, for example, regarding what Mexico should do when the USA was claiming that the Mexican debt regarding uh, the water agreement with the USA, and we had four different uh, positions. One coming from Castaneda, the other one coming from Krill, from the Ministry of the Interior, the other one coming from the head of the water department in Mexico, and the other one coming from, uh, I can't remember, from, um, from the speaker of the Los Pinos. Yeah? The third issue is that of uh, party uh, government. So the first is cabinet formation and leadership. The second would be political communication. The third issue would be that of party government relation. Again, it is common knowledge that Fox was considered a pan-outsider and that Fox did not do, mu do much to incorporate the party into governmental politics. The widely held point of view that the party did not back Fox, that the PAN did not back Fox initiatives is not upheld by, by evidence. If you go to Congress, uh, I conducted a piece of research on executive legislative relations in which I analyze the totality of roll call votes in Congress and it shows not only that PAN backed each and every bill sent or supported by the executive, but also that PAN was the most disciplined party of all in Congress. Nonetheless, it is true that relations between PAN and the President were difficult all along from the beginning to the very end. PAN repeatedly complained that it was excluded from the drafting of policies, from decision-making units, and from the distribution of medium to high-level appointments. On the other side, side, Fox objected that the party never uh, supported him wholeheartedly. Calderón is a party man, we know that. Uh, being a party man, having been Pan's national leader and a congressman himself, will surely establish a much more productive relation with his party Nonetheless, there are already red lights relating to the uh, overtly difficult relation between Calderón and PAN's leader. Mr. Espino, the head of the PAN, won the internal party election against Calderón's candidate, who was uh, Carlos Medina Plasencia, two and a half years ago. And in turn, Espino backed Calderón's opponent in last year primaries in Mexico. Uh, Espino backed uh, Santiago Krill against Calderón or the other two uh, PANS candidates. Uh, the bottom line is that there is a misconception about party governmental relations in Mexico due to the historical fusion between party and government during PRI's uh, rule. A fusion that uh, was heavily criticized by PAN because it involved the annulment of the party and also the illegitimate and illegal transfer of resources from government to party. What both Calderón and Pan um, must understand, and Fox and Pan never understood during this term, is that conditions for such a perverse fusion are no longer in place, and that it is not only natural, but also legitimate for the party to behave as uh, the party in government. They must understand that they are in need of each other, and that they can both benefit from holding power. The fourth issue area is that of um, betting all governmental success to dealings that are not within the power of the president. Fox uh, committed his, himself to objectives, to goals, that did not depend on his goodwill 
on his technical capacities or on his powers. Two of his most publicized ambitions were those, as you know, of public, uh, of fiscal and energy reform, for which he needed to gather the two-thirds majority. Not only did he personally battle for these reforms, compromising his political capital, but also made other goals depend on the fate of these two reforms. And the same can, and the same can be said of his other main project, that is the migra migration agreement, which depended on the US Congress. In the case of the absence of reforms and its impact on growth and employment, he repeatedly blamed Congress, but in the end, it was the executive, as it happens in every presidential system, which appeared inefficient and unskillful. It would not be wise, I believe, for Calderon to follow the same path as Fox did. He will certainly have to play the card of Congress but he should be prepared from the very beginning to govern through public policies and to have alternative options in case reforms are blocked in Congress. Um, and uh, just, to, just to finish, uh, the fifth issue area is that of governmental prog uh, that is that of um, no, there, there are two more. One is that of governmental uh, programs. Uh, focusing on two or three priorities based on legitimate demands that can be easily identified by the population and that can become the landmark of the new administration is always uh, helpful and Fox didn't do this again. Just to give an example, everybody remembers President Salinas back in 1994 for his success of two very well-defined and transcendent policies which were Solidaridad, his, his social program, and uh, the NAFTA. If we want a more recent example, we can take Andres Manuel López Obrador in Capital City, whenever you made polls. The only two policies remembered by everyone in Mexico City was that all the, of the, as we call it, the oldest, Los Viejitos, the pension for old people, and that of the second layer of the periférico, the second layer of the, of the highway in Mexico City. And um, the last issue area now in which Fox failed and must receive attention from Calderón, that of what I termed the poderes facticos, the closest term would maybe be something like the powers that be, remembering uh, C. Wright Mill's uh, book. Legislators have continually been blamed for blocking structural reforms, and they deserve being blamed. But what about other social forces who likewise have obstructed change in Mexico? Social forces that successfully blackmail the government in order to retain economic, social, and even legal privileges. I'm speaking about the monopoly, the public or private, the monopoly that uh, Mr. Slim has in the telephone companies. I'm speaking about the, pro uh, the television stations in Mexico, which is a duopoly. I'm speaking about cement. I'm speaking about very many industries. As I was saying, uh, the Mexican economy is full of uh, monopolies. Poor growth, unequal distribution, lack of competitiveness, shortage of opportunities, undersupplied public services have all to do with private and public monopolies and with a corporatist arrangement of organized interests that were certainly inherited by Fox, they were not created by Fox, but that were left untouched during his administration. Pemex, the Sindicato of the Teachers uh, Trade Unions, the private monopolies, the, uh, the media. So Calderón will either have to confront or to strike a deal with the powers that, that be, if he intends to be a successful president whose true purpose is, as he has claimed up to now, to transform the country into a fully democratic nation and its economy, especially its economy, into a world-class economy. I believe those are the five issue areas in which he has a lot to learn from uh, Fox's administration and that uh, if he improves on that, he will for sure make a better presidency than a uh, Fox did or was able to do. Thank you.
do you feel there is a contradiction? I mean, this, this issue area, any president that, that succeeded at this would be the best president in Mexican history, right? But um, do, do you feel there is a contradiction between some of these, these areas? For example, negotiating with, a, on the one hand, with, a, with the other parties, and on the other hand, with the private monopolies and, and, the, and the slim and, those, and the likes of those, is likely to lead to compromise, is, is likely to, to lead to things that, you know, to be in not uh, inconsistent with other things that are needed, uh, such as um, uh, reforms to, to increase jobs or to jumpstart the economy, right? Um, so yeah. you have to deal with the sindicatos and you have to deal with Pemex and, and you have to give in somewhere, but at the same time you want to break the monopolies, break the sindicatos and uh, pass all these reforms. How, I mean, what's, what do you see happening or, or what would you do in Calderon's place? <laughs> I agree with you. you. I mean, as a president, I think it's, uh, it's not a good idea to open so many fronts at the same time, yes. But there are certain things that I believe that one day Mexicans will have to start. I, I mean, there has to be a beginning. Le let me give you two examples. When uh, someone gave Fox the idea of uh, going with this adventure of impeachment, yes, to Lopez Obrador, I could, I, I could stand up here and say that it was a lawful action, yes. But we had to think, everybody thought, yes, that how come that Fox was going to apply law for the first time, yes, in this matter, in this issue, minor issue, yes, and against such uh, such, a, such an actor, no? Andres Manuel López Obrador. Andres Manuel López Obrador should be very grateful f for Fox's uh, proceedings, no? But anyway, but uh, I, anyway, when are we going to begin to apply law, to go against monopolies, to go against privileges, to go against uh, governors? Uh, we, we live in this permanent contradiction, yes? For years we have struggled, for example, for the president not to interfere with local politics and not to touch governors and let them govern and take care of their of their uh, states yes and as soon as you uh, uh, as soon as there is a problem everybody asks the president to go or the federation or the center yes to go and solve the problems so we live in this permanent contradiction between having to do things and wanting to do things and then the minute we do it yes we are all against it. Take again another example, the public force. There is a great debate in Mexico whether the, public, the use of public force is, in the case of Oaxaca, is legitimate or it is not legitimate. Okay. Uh, I would say it is legitimate, yes, if it is backed by the law. And I believe that the, in this case it is backed by the law, yes. It, it is in order to preserve to preserve law and order. However, how come the police enters Oaxaca, yes, and then takes the APO people and the teachers, but leaves all, all these cronies, you say, cronies, cronies, uh, of uh, Ulises Ruiz's uh, government, yes? So I have no answer. Yes, we have to begin. We have to begin someday. And I believe that we have to begin giving signs. Felipe Calderón has to begin giving signs that he is determined, yes, not to be the rehen, how do you say? Hostage. The hostage of these public and private monopolies, no matter what. He has a good argument now. The entrepreneurs, the business class in Mexico was really, was truly, um, Miedosa uh, was truly afraid, yes, that Andres Manuel López Obrador could win. And it has been said, yes, that in many meetings they have said, well, we saved ourselves just by a thin hair. So we better uh, start giving up, some, giving up some of our privileges. Otherwise, next time we will not be so lucky, yes. Calderón, I think he has this mechanism, this instrument. As far as I know, he has been uh, using this kind of arguments. And uh, maybe 
maybe only, yeah, because uh, Fox didn't touch the media. Not only he didn't touch the media, he gave the media everything. He didn't touch a, a tax uh, exemptions uh, for most uh, uh, monopolies, yes. He left all the trade union structure untouched. It is impressive, untouched. If by any chance the PRI had recovered power now in, and, uh, in the 2006 elections, the PRI would have found the same structure only reinforced, yes? Mm -hmm. And that, that is uh, very frustrating, yes? I know what you're talking about and I know I'm not answering you, but mm -hmm. I, I think he should give it a try. very uh, striking paradox, which is Calderon needs the shortlist to affect in some way the power and the privileges of those of those he needs to govern. Uh, oh, of, yes. of those yeah. actors who support him to govern. Ah, who, who brought him to power, you mean? Who, well, okay. I haven't. Okay. Apparently they brought him to power, but he needs their uh, consent to yeah. govern. So I, I think that that's like a Un callejón sin salida. But well, my, my my two questions are this. The first one is um, I spent the summer in Mexico and I remain in touch with people there. And I read the media a lot. And um, in the post-electoral period, it, it, I felt like um, we were like stranded between two, two intransigences. In, intransigences. Uh, do you feel that now that somehow you know the temperature has um, diminished? Is there a possibility of reconciliation, or more specifically, how to bring back the PRD to the table? Especially to bring it public. To, to bring it publicly? In public. Because, I mean, you just pointed out that you know, some PRD members are indeed negotiating and all, but publicly they are completely off uh, the map. And my second question is, what are we to do with the electoral tribunal's resolution? and what it said about the inequalities of the Okay. Uh, regarding you, your first uh, uh, question, I do honestly believe that uh, there was much more intransigency from the PRD than from uh, PAN. I mean, this is obvious, PAN was the winning, uh, I mean, in the end, uh, the winning party. Okay. There are some uh, positive signs on the part of uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador. One of them came only a couple of days ago when he said that most, uh, he was talking about the cabinet, that he, the legitimate cabinet that he's going to form. And uh, he said something like this. He said that he was going to start working with uh, his followers in order to uh, make up an, ag an agenda, an agenda which final goal is to do a new constitution and this political reform that he wants, but that he was going to uh, to give this uh, this uh, agenda, legislative agenda, to the PRD in Congress, and that they were allowed, yes, to negotiate it not with the president, but but with the f with his fellow with their fellow uh, congressmen. Okay. That's a sign from Andres Manuel. I'm sorry, but it is. Second, uh, I, am, I have mixed feelings about how to behave towards the PRT. I mean, if, if I was a politician and a good one, yes, I should try everything to bring the PRD into the table of negotiation. What yes. I should be saying is that Calderón should be trying to, to bring the PRD into the, into the negotiating table. And he has been doing so. And he has been doing so openly and closely. Yes, openly, as I was saying, because all governors have gone to see este, Felipe Calderón in his transition house. And they have all declared, except the major of Mexico City, except the, go the governor of Mexico City, that they will deal with Calderón. Yes, and uh, they have been doing it also not openly. Uh, everybody in Mexico knows that most, well, uh, the leaders of the PRD have been seeing 
Felipe Calderón, Josefina Vázquez Mota, Jorge Alcocer Lately, and uh, Juan Camilo Mourinho, all the closest uh, collaborators of, of Felipe Calderón. But they do not do it in the open because that brings uh, problems with Andrés Manuel uh, López Obrador. I think that in the end what will prevail is that part of the PRD who is conscious, uh, con uh, who knows that they made this great leap forward, that they know that they are losing ground because of all these uh, post-electoral um, uh, actions by Andrés Manuel uh, López Obrador, and also that they do not want López Obrador as a leader. As you know, the PRD is a very divided party, and there is part of this party, and part of it, um, and most of those members of the less radical wing of the PRD are in Congress. So I think it is rational for them and they will take the opportunity of gaining the party again, yes? We will see, but I think they should uh, appeal to that sector of the, of the left in Mexico, of, of the rational left in Mexico City, yes? Of the left that is willing to go on struggling uh, to get power and through the institutional means, yes. The, the great difference between the old uh, left in Mexico and the new left in Mexico that came around the 80s is when they, decide, when they decided that they would play by the rules. And if, if I would show you the numbers of how the PRD or the left in general has grown from the moment in the mid-70s, yes, in which uh, people, very respectable people like uh, Berto Castillo decided to move from the anti-electoral stand to the electoral one, well, it is amazing, yes, because it is not true that this is the first time that the PRD has gained so much in, in the house, in the lower house. They have exactly the same number of deputies as they had in 1997. The thing is that in, in 2000 and 2003, they lost a lot and they, and, and they had very bad coalitions. They had to uh, distribute a lot of seats, yes. But if you look at numbers, in, on the intermediate elections 1997, they had exactly the same number of deputies as they have won. Nonetheless, they almost duplicated their seats in, in the Senate House. And they have five governors, almost as many as, as PAN, no? So I think it's not a bad, I mean, it's good betting uh, to stay within the institutions in Mexico. Well, last one, last question, please. Yes, uh, Lynn is in Mexico City from July 2nd to August 7th. And uh, I, I was wondering what you think about what the country will do about the fate of democracy. I, every day when I was there, would walk down the forma every day. <laughs> and I literally saw the protest grow from the Zocolo to Polanco. When I left, it was in Polanco, <laughs> which is a far distance. Yeah, I live there. And they were living in tents, and one of the nights I was there, it rained so hard that the rain was past the rain. And they were there in the tents singing songs. Yeah, I know. And I wonder what Mexico is going to do about their faith in democracy. These about people, their faith in democracy and mm. the electoral process. These people were there every day, <coughs> no matter what. They had displays that were based on their political beliefs. You know, Obrador aside, <laughs> put them aside for a moment. The people that were living on the street who wanted and felt and believed that they were robbed of their democracy. What does Mexico do with these people? When this happens to them, what, what will happen in the next election? You know, this is in the United States. We've had two elections that have been fraught with fraud and claims of fraud, and we have a population that is very disheartened about the electoral process. Do you see that happening in Mexico? Do you see something like that as a possibility? I'm glad you bring this point because I think one of the of the most difficult uh, challenges for Felipe. Calderón, or for anyone who governs, in, especially in places like, uh, like Mexico, is 
to show the population that it is worth living in a democratic country. Because if democracy is not, I mean, the problem is that democracy is not a system uh, that, that was invented in, in order to have economic progress. You, you cannot ask democracy things that democracy cannot give you. Nonetheless, uh, when politicians sell democracy, they're selling very many things, yes? And among them, they're selling uh, embetterment for the, for the population. So uh, I do believe that in places in Latin America in general, but especially in Mexico, um, uh, one of the challenges is, is to explain, to, to make clear, yes, that it is worth having a democratic uh, country or democratic institutions, and that, um, the, that economic performance does not necessarily depend on democracy, and that it is better to have democracy and uh, uh, democracy and, and low, low uh, growth than authoritarianism and low growth. The problem with polls, and we had this discussion with the people from the United Nations that uh, the, um, produced this uh, document on, on democracy, in one of the polls, because I, was, I, I participated in it, in one of the polls, one of the questions was, do you prefer democracy, yes, and living in bad conditions, or authoritarianism and living in, go in good conditions? Well, it's obvious. I would, uh, I would also answer that I'd rather have authoritarianism and, and have my child in a health system and not muriéndose de hambre, things like that, no? The problem is that you have to ask whether democracy, together with good economic conditions, or authoritarianism with good economic conditions, okay? So I think there are only two, two ways. One is a matter of political and civic education, yes? And the second one is that Felipe Calderón is definitely obliged to take, uh, to take over most of Andrés Manuel's López Obrador social agenda, yes? People in Mexico, so we have very extreme le levels of extreme poverty, yes? If we don't end with that, democracy will not, we, will not thrive. It is impossible for democracy to thrive with, uh, with the inequalities that we have in, in Mexico, with the privileges that we have in Mexico, with uh, uh, absolutely no access to justice of at least 60% of the population. Yes. So that's a great responsibility, how to make people appreciate democracy in spite of the fact that we are not advancing in economic and, and uh, social uh, terms. And I didn't answer your second question regarding the, whether I think it was an unequal. What to do with the tribunal's resolution that pointed out explicitly uh, in a, in a well, if, if, if you read the resolution, which is a very long resolution, it said that they were, there were certainly inequalities that uh, neither the president nor these famous entrepreneurs that made this roadshow, the uh, TV roadshow, didn't incur, well, especially the president didn't incur in the illegality. Yeah, we have a very, the, I don't know, we have a very precise legislation in some aspects, and we have a very, um, there are many loopholes in, 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 the, in the legislation. Uh, I believe that President did not violate the law with his sayings, with his discourses, etc. I think he behaved very unwisely, politically speaking, and that's what, after all, the ruling of the electoral authorities, of, of the electoral justices said that there was inequality, but the inequality was not big enough in order to alter the, um, the, the results. What happen, happens if we review the, cover, the media coverage and how much each of the parties spent on TV and radio? It turns out, according to the IFE, that the PRD was the party that spent most on uh, uh, electronic media. It turns out also that uh, Andres Manuel was the candidate that was mostly covered over the pre, over the pan, and that he had 
the most neutral notes, yes, not negative, not positive, from from the from the anchors. How how do you call them? From, from the from the media in general, yes. So, uh, what if the pan of the PRI started saying that the media coverage was favoring Andres Manuel? Okay, as the Fox was favoring uh, Calderon, but then the media was favoring. We would, I mean, we would never uh, end. The other kind of uh, of um, complaints that the PRD made were things like, uh, for example, the famosa Guerra Sucia. Yes, that's the, the language that uh, Felipe Calderon was using. But the, the justices said, well, you used the same language. You were even in that. Another one which was important, which was the use of social programs in order to benefit Felipe Calderon, was never proved. I don't believe uh, someone at CIDE made a, made a study uh, trying to make a correlation between local elections during the whole of Fox administration and the use of social programs, and the correlation was negative for the PAN. Yes, if you take Chiapas, for example, in the midterm elections, and you take Chiapas now, it turns out that in those places where Fox uh, sent more money and more opportunities, uh, program oportunidades, were exactly in the counties that PAN lost. Yes, after giving all this money, giving all these programs. So out of the 12 uh, complaints that the PRD filed be before the tribunal, uh, nine of them were disregarded because there were no proof of, the, of such, uh, such uh, fraud no? or such inequalities. Yes, there were inequalities. I think that we should, I mean, I am against regulations. I think that just as in the United States, the president should be able to make open campaign uh, in favor of his party, yes, and, but together with it, I believe that we need to, uh, an electoral reform, a very profound electoral reform in order to remove the power of the media from electoral campaigns, yes, uh, and we would, I think we would win three things. For, First, uh, elections in Mexico are very, very expensive. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous how, how much we spend of uh, public spending, yes? Second, the media, the, the duopoly of the TV, uh, have an enormous political uh, power. And three, mm -hmm. uh, the population at large is really, uh, I mean, don't want uh, campaigns that go on for over six months formally and over one year if we take the whole uh, electoral uh, process. So why don't we make just, if, if you gave me one reform in terms of a political reform, I would say, well, two or three things, but one of them would be, well, obviously one is re-election, see? The other one is, uh, it would be not to allow the parties to buy uh, uh, Publicity, to uh, force the media to have free access to free access to them. Uh, we don't need even we we don't even need free access because the state in Mexico, the nation, That's has exactly. what we call official time. Instead of the TV paying taxes, they pay through time on TV. So if the if the Mexican government gives that free time to the parties during campaign uh, the period then you wouldn't have to spend all that money and you would take all the leverage that the TV has over politics uh, in Mexico. No?